Hi. I don't know if I've been here in a while. Probably not. But today we're going to talk about that word everybody hates to hear, but it's a real thing called autism. And why is there a spectrum? What is it? What causes it? Hint, it's not vaccines. All right, so what is autism? I've got all the links below. And to make something very long and complicated really short, which is kind of my strength, so I'm going with that. Autism is just a sensory overload. There is just too much stuff going around. So people who don't have autism, who aren't on the spectrum, can ignore the fact that there's, you know, lots of lights going on at a concert. They can ignore, you know, all sorts of things. But when it comes to being on the spectrum, those things just come straight in and our brain goes, whoa, there's too much crap and I don't know what to focus on and I don't know what to do. And that's why there is a spectrum because they're now realizing there are some people who are more affected than others. And we're going to Yep, I have notes, making sure I get this right. So what causes autism? The researchers, they're not sure yet. And there's some across the globe in every country, in every developed world universities, there's people studying this. What they do know so far is that it is a genetic thing, as in you're born with it. But they don't know which gene it is ever hear of the Human Genome Project? This is part of it. Cancer is another part of that. I'm not gonna go there. But they do know that it has to do with genetics, but what specific gene and how it gets passed on, they still don't know. They're trying to figure it out. But they do know that it has nothing to do with vaccines. And when it comes to the vaccine thing, most people hadn't heard of it until Jenny McCarthy decided to make a huge deal. She might have even written a book when her son got diagnosed with autism. Yet she wanted to help him. I'm not gonna, you know, bash Jenny McCarthy in this because her, her heart and her head was in the right place. She was trying to help because at that time, it was not proven false yet. So what she was referring to was a paper or a study that was published in 1998. Notes, this one's important in 1998 by a Mr. Andrew Wakefield. And in that study that he published, he made a link between the MMR vaccine, so that's the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine that everybody gets at, I don't know how old, um, and then it caused autism. And he put that paper out there, and somewhere along the line, Miss McCarthy came along and she read it, and you know, there was nothing to say that it wasn't true. However, it has been proven false since then. In 2004, it was proven false and redacted. She didn't take it back then, though. And then in 2010, it was proven completely false to the point that Mr. Wakefield admitted that he made it up. He wanted to get published, so he kind of made it all up. She still hasn't taken all that back yet, by the way, which is where people will kind of get a little bit irked about this. But her heart was in the right place. But after he went, because there was a court and everything, he got charged with um, serious professional misconduct and is no longer allowed to practice medicine in the UK. And now I don't think any other country would also let him practice medicine, so we're not going to call him doctor or anything. But he made up a study, okay? He made it up. It wasn't true. So stop saying that vaccines cause autism. They don't. Some dude wanted to be famous and he made crap up and everybody's kind of following it, so don't. But when it comes to what actually causes it, we still don't know. And I guess that's a, the unknown is scary. I get that. So when it comes to autism and why is there a spectrum more, why, what? 
because I need to, I can't go there without talking about the symptoms because that's the whole thing. What are the symptoms of autism? They vary. It depends on what level or how much they're affected. So as per the spectrum, I got the notes. I got notes still. Um, there's different categories amongst it. This is why they call it a spectrum, you know, from light to dark kind of a thing. So there is a thing and it's only been recognized in the past, I don't know, 10 years or so called high functioning autism. And that happens to be me. We just found that out not that long ago, not the point. And then there's something a little bit more that's called Asperger's syndrome. And there's, after that, there is what uh, a lot of my personal friends' children have. It's pers hard to say, pervasive developmental disorder. So they are autistic. They're not quite, you know, functional on their own. They need to go to the special schools, have the special ed teachers to teach them, which means they can learn to, you know, figure things out just like I have to learn as well. But they need someone to teach them all sorts of things. And a lot of, you know, stuff at once is, is a lot. But they're not on like the actual, what they call autistic disorder. And what they call the autistic disorder are the ones that, that don't talk. They'll sit in a corner and, you know, maybe rock or they'll draw or something, but they're not, they're not verbal. They're actually called nonverbal. And there's a difference, but most people these days that get diagnosed with autism fall under the pervasive developmental disorder part where, yeah, they have a rough time and they need help. They might need help their whole lives, but it doesn't mean that they can't accomplish good things. It just means that they're not, you know, so affected that they need to be institutionalized and watched 24 seven, but they're also not function enough to be considered Asperger's or high functioning. So they probably may not be able to like, get a full time job or maybe, I mean, I don't know. People surprise people all the time. Like it's crazy, but those are briefly what the little lines on the spectrum is. All right. So we've established that there was a spectrum, you know, there's one end and then there's like the end where people really, you know, need a lot of help. I happen to be at this end where it's high functioning autism. And for me, it's only been a few years since they figured it out. Now I do have to thank my aunt out in Manitoba. She is an amazing person. She works with, I mean, she was a teacher's or principal. Um, she just recognizes a lot of things and she really helps people and she brought it out. But for the most part, I mean, most people who are high functioning autism that only figure it out as adults were misdiagnosed their whole lives as mentally ill. Now, yes, um, mental illness and high functioning autism, they are intertwined. You know, sometimes you have a little bit of both. They're not mutually exclusive, which means that you don't have to have both for something to happen. You can have just high functioning autism and you can have just you know, like OCD bipolar, which is usually what high functioning autism people kind of get diagnosed with, or you can actually have a little bit of both and it all mixed up. It doesn't matter. But for me, I happen to be one of them and nothing irks me more than when I watch TV and that Mr. Sheldon Cooper or, you know, Sean from The Good Doctor and lots of other TV shows, um, they're, I think the guy in Numbers, not the point, you know, and as well, um, that movie way back, what's it called, Al Pacino, where he goes and counts the cards, Rain Man, there you go. No. That is not how autistic people are. That is not high functioning autism. No. Sheldon Cooper is a bad representation of any kind of autism. You cannot be. Because yes, for the most part, people that do have autism or are on the spectrum usually tend to have a higher IQ. But just because you have a high IQ doesn't mean you have the social skills. And they do have, you know, I mean, I'm going to get into math if I start, you know, charts, you know, the up, down, whatever. So the higher your IQ is, the more intellect you have, the less social abilities you have. 
So if you are of the intelligence level of Sheldon Cooper, you cannot be that social. There's no way that you'd be able to interact with people. And I mean, if you've watched the shows of the Big Bang Theory over the years, Sheldon's character develops feelings, even has a relationship, he's married now. If somebody really were Asperger's, to have that level of intelligence, I, there's no way that they could recognize feelings in other people. There's no way that they, they just can't. It is part of how, you know, what autism is, how it affects your brain. It makes one part work really, really well, and it kind of kills the other part. So there's no way that you can do both. Um, but when it comes to the good doctor, there are some things that I do like that they show. However, it's still impossible. If you're that intelligent, like as they show him, you know, where he thinks in his mind and all things. Um, yes, that is kind of how our thinking works when we're trying to think of that stuff. If you were to give a visual representation of how an autistic person thinks, that's, that's true. And I do like how they show the good, you know, Sean, the good doctor, as you know, he says things like inappropriately, like, yeah, well, he has cancer and he's going to die. Well, that that's true. We, we do. I mean, I had to learn to not say that. And sometimes I still accidentally do. But to be, again, at his level of intellect, the social cues, he wouldn't be able to have them like that. Um, I do like the representation, though. But just know that it's not real, real. <laughs> OK, OK. I'm done bitching about TV shows and people, whatever. I cannot speak really for like people that are on the other parts of the spectrum because I'm not there. I do have a very good friend of mine who is Asperger's. He does have it. And I am, I know that he would really love to come and speak with you to let you all know, you know, his journey, how it affects his life. But it's still... The social interaction part is still a little bit too rough for him, but maybe, maybe one of these days we'll be able to have him here. But I'm going to speak to you about like, you know, high functioning autism and how it affects people and how, you know, I guess those symptoms and how you can see it. So those were the symptoms that, you know, my aunt saw in me and that we looked up and whatnot. One of them is that I don't look people in the eye. I never have. I mean, it's it's really hard and it made job interviews so hard because that's one of the things they score people on. So I had to like, you know, force myself to look in them in the eye, but like not too much. And what it was so hard to the same point that I don't usually look at the camera even when I do this stuff. Um, so when I meet people, I, I usually look at their mouths. I also have a hard time hearing which goes to the fact that I have a sensory overload. I have gone to have my hearing tested because I thought I was going deaf. I'm not. It's just that I hear everything. My brain has no filter for all of the noises. So right now it's raining outside. So I hear the rain. I also hear like the air exchanger going sometimes or somebody else's dishwasher. I hear all those things and they all add up and I have no way of just blanking one out. They all come in at once so that's also why I speak very very loudly and I also don't recognize my own tone of voice so that has helped me you know in a negative way I should say it's affected my life in a negative way in my past and still does to this day except now I tend to have people that understand and will kind of be like um that was kind of rude and I'll say it again but I tend to come off as rude and mean as like I don't care but not because I intend to, I do care. I just don't realize that I'm saying something in a mean way. And there's also other things that I'm not necessarily going to get into that I just see from a different perspective, mostly when it comes to death. I don't know how, I mean, I've learned how to say, you know, I, I'm sorry to people who've lost loved ones. But I do care, but I see death in a different way that it's a natural part of life. And I mean, you're old, you die. And I know that sounds, you know, really, really mean. And I don't mean to be mean. 
And I understand that other people are hurting and they're in pain. And I mean, I have people that I've lost in my lifetime. And yes, I'm sad that they're gone. I'm sad that they're not here anymore. I wish that I could speak to them and all those things. But am I sad that they are dead? No, because to me, it's life. I see them in two different aspects while everybody else in the world kind of puts it all together in one big same thing. So that's one example of how I sound rude. I do it on purpose. But I mean, it ends up making me socially awkward. And I know you're going to be like, well, everybody's socially awkward, by the way, which we all are. We're all socially awkward. But it doesn't mean we all have like autism. It just means that there's some people in this world that just might be assholes. That just might be their thing. I mean, the DSM-5 now has a diagnosis and a medication for everything because the DSM is written by the big pharma companies in the United States that want to make money, blah, blah, blah. You can technically diagnose anybody with anything these days. But sometimes people are just jerks and that's just their thing. There's nothing wrong with them. They don't have bipolar disorder. They don't have a personality disorder. They're just a jerk. And you know what? That's fine. We need to stop labeling everybody. Let oddball Bob down the street be oddball Bob down the street and let him do his thing. There's nothing wrong with him, right? But when it comes to saying that like everybody's socially awkward and that I am, yes, because everybody that's watching this and thinking, well, everybody's socially awkward, you've never met me in person. Now, I'm aware of myself. That's why I can kind of laugh and I can talk about it. But you've definitely not met me in person. Because if you were, you would definitely understand what I mean with socially awkward. Because when you speak with me, because I'm comfortable enough, I'm either uncomfortable where I don't say a thing. I just kind of stand there awkwardly and hold my hands and like want to leave. I, I look like the weird kid. I just... Or if I'm actually comfortable enough to talk, there is no chance in hell that you're going to get a word in endwise. Because I do not shut up. I don't know the social cues when it's my turn to speak in a conversation. I don't know when, you know, the subject is said and done and we need to move on. I'll just keep going. And then the ADHD kicks in. And within 10 minutes, I started off from, you know, talking about cows. And I went to, you know, bananas and diseases down to, you know, the shit that Stalin did during the World War II as his whatever. And I'll just go on and on. Yeah. If you meet me in person, very hard to follow and good luck trying to tell me stuff. But my friends have learned to be like, yo, shut up for five minutes. I got something to say. And then I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. I can learn. That's the thing. Everything in the spectrum that's higher than like autism disorder, we can learn some things. We can. And the higher you are functionality, the more things you can learn. But you have to want to learn them too. Another thing. I'm not going to go there. So you, yeah, you. I'm sorry if I have invaded your personal space if we've met in person. Because again, I have no knowledge of what someone else's personal space is. I know what mine is, kind of. But not really, because I've ended up in some really sticky situations. Thankfully, nothing bad ever happened where I don't realize the personal space thing and that the person I'm kind of flirting with the person and they think that something's going to happen. And pff, no, no, I don't know that. I, hmm, it's kind of why I don't like leaving my house. But and um, yeah, routines. I have one. Hardcore. Do not surprise me. Don't even try. I mean, I'm, I'll be thankful and grateful if it's like a, birth, a nice thing, but I'll still be so overwhelmed from all these new things that I wasn't expecting. But I'm also thinking like, ah, but it's friends on TV and I got to watch it at four o'clock. Like that's just how I am. I literally need to have cable because that's how I know what time is to eat. Friends comes on time to start making supper like literally I have a routine if I don't follow that routine I am not in a good mood 
And sometimes I'll get really mad and act inappropriately if my routine is really disrupted. It sucks. I have to learn to live with it and I have to learn to not let that disruption, you know, really get to me. I'm working on it, but it's still something that it's going to come to a point where, you know, I can't help some of it. I'm working on it. Being aware of it, though, is pretty good because then I can warn other people, like, don't ask me last minute to do anything. Like, you got to give me, like, a week to, like, figure out that, yeah, I'm going to leave my house and I'm going to go to this place. And then I think about it. It's <clears throat> but that's me. <clears throat> There's other people out there that have, you know, high functioning autism that have different symptoms that react differently to different things. And I've learned recently through my friend who, you know, may or may not come on this channel that being super warm is actually like warmth is an autistic thing. We don't like being very warm because I'm always like the windows half open and you know sweatshirts and stuff i don't like hot showers i don't like taking baths yeah a sensory thing being too warm is something that autistic people tend to not like be great now i learned that so i can work around that so it's not just me being uncomfortable i mean it is me being uncomfortable but there's a reason why and i can work on that so that's good and <clears throat> the last one you're all going to laugh, but that's okay. I like buttons. I like pushing buttons and I like me some shiny things. Yes. Like shiny syndrome. I, I have that. I have always had, you know, shiny syndrome. Um, so that might explain why I, I like glitter <laughs> and sparkles and bedazzle everything all the time. But I mean, it's my house and they're my nails and it doesn't, bother you know it's my life i want to have bedazzled stuff all over my house sure it's my house if people come to my house and they don't like it well then they just don't have to come again that's it and you know if the relationship with that person is special enough to me i may take some of those bedazzles and glitter down it all depends on the situation but yeah i like glittery and shiny things it has to do with the high functioning autism so is my love of makeup it it has it's more complicated for me to explain here but you know super focus on one thing i go through phases just like everybody else i know what they are that's cool i'm lucky though you know i'm, I'm the place where i do have some good follow-up there's people working with me to learn more and i'm still learning and i'm always going to learn for now, I guess that's all I can say because that's all I've learned so far. I've only known that I've had it for about you know a year and a half, two years now. And I'm only really getting into the research now and learning all the different things. And I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's more. So if anybody out there wants to know more about like Asperger's or the other parts of the spectrum, let me know. I have no problem doing more research. Again, I have people that I talk to that are professionals that do, you know, help me with the research and the information so that it's proper and okay. So if you want to hear more, just don't hesitate, you know, let me know. I can do more. I don't have a problem. And just maybe, just maybe my friend will come along and maybe he'll be like over there, you know, because I have a whole YouTube, you know, room now. He might be over there off camera answering. Maybe we can get that done. I don't know. But I do know that he wants to share uh, his life with people. And it's a very um, eye-opening... I mean, he tries. I, props to you, buddy. But, yeah. Being autistic is not the end of the world. It's not. And now that I think and I know there, and I've recently said this to a friend of mine, I wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah, I see the world in a different way and it makes my life more complicated than it needs to be. But I like how I see the world. And it does leave me that I need a little bit of protection because I tend to see the good in everything and in everyone and I'm easily taken advantage of. But I'm aware of that now and I do have a few people in my life who both happen to be named Mel. One's my sister, one's my best friend. 
that are there and if I were to end up in a place where someone was trying to take advantage of me or whatnot, they'll interfere and either tell me or tell that person, you know. They're out, they're, they've got my back, I'm learning, and sometimes I think, I think they like that I'll find the good in, in a subject or, or a situation that, you know, I mean, everybody goes through a bad time in their life, no matter what you have. You don't have to have any kind of mental illness. You don't have to have anything. Sometimes people have bad days, and that's fine. And sometimes, like I said, people are just assholes. That's just what they are. They like being a jerk. They like being mean. They're cynical, and that's just who they are. They don't need a label. That's just who they are. And from there, I will let you go because, again, the ADHD is starting to kick in, and I don't know where to go from here because... I've said everything that's on my notes. So, yeah. On top of everything, you know, mental health wise, I also happen to be high functioning autistic. Do I care? No. It's me. It's who I am. I'll learn, and I am learning to live with it, to try to be the best me that I can be. So, thanks.